what's up guys welcome malik here we're gonna share something that i find like extremely interesting so this guy is tony Sieber, right he's an author world-renowned author educator and co-founder of a company called rethink x and then and believe me this is very interesting i want you guys to just listen to this and i'm gonna just cut it into parts to find the most interesting parts and then just really focusing on what this guy is saying he has a track record of being right so we're gonna actually listen to this guy and see the knowledge that he's putting out so basically rethink x is a independent think tank that analyzes and forecasts the speed and scale of technology driven disruption and its implications across society so basically rethink x he tries to analyze the data and analyze how technology is progressing to a point where it starts to create abundance and a lot of benefits to the people so it's like we get internet and then internet starts to have people be so connected people get very productive people can do scalable tasks so basically that company has a good track record, track record of analyzing and forecasting exactly that by just looking at some by just by like looking at the scale of how things progress and tony siba has a great track record of doing this i'm going to listen to one of his um talks right now so let's get into it so let's get into it right now okay let's so so basically the title is the disruption of energy rethinking energy from 2020 to 2030 so this was shot in 2020 right 100 percent solar wind and batteries is just the beginning so let's listen to tony siba now and i'm gonna slip to the most important parts Talk about the coming disruption of energy so start with technology cost curves solar is the cheapest form of energy generation on the planet, unsubsidized. Solar today is the cheapest source of energy in history. Not See here that solar is the cheapest source of energy in history. Do you believe that? Nothing else is as cheap as solar today, right? You know, this is why we've seen solar capacity grow by thousands of percent in just a decade. And okay. today solar is so cheap that the total costs of solar are lower than just the operating costs of coal, nukes, oil, or gas generation. That's today. So even if you get that gas power plant for free, the costs of running that power plant are higher than all the cost of solar. And that's happening today. What do you think is going to happen to coal, nuke, oil, and gas? They're disrupted, right? They can't compete. For purely economic reasons, solar is already disrupting everything else. Now, solar improved by 82% in costs in the 2010s. Is that shocking? Because, you know, some folks said that that was unpredictable. Bill Gates <laughs> said that that was unpredictable. In fact, well, I did predict it. In 2010, I wrote an article, uh, an op-ed in the San Francisco Chronicle that said exactly that, that I expected solar costs to drop 80 to 90% over the next decade, and unsubsidized solar would be cheaper than anything else, right? So the cost curves, again, are like gravity. These things can be predicted, right? I don't care what anybody's uh, opinion of gravity is that is so just know that was a prediction he made in 2010 may 2010 that solar costs would drop 80 to 90 percent over the next decade 2010 tony siba and solar is so cheap that there's a company in australia building um, uh, houses with solar panels solar panels are so cheap that you can use them instead of structural plywood. Even if you don't generate energy, 
solar PV is cheaper than plywood. That's happening today. So, you so what he said there, solar panels are literally cheaper than plywood in some areas. So it could make sense for you to just build the solar panels onto the house and use those, even if they're not generating energy, use those structurally instead of using the plywood. And if you want to tap into them to use them for energy generation, you could because you already have the technology built in already. You get all that energy for free, right? It's a gift. It's essentially buy the house, get free energy, or buy the energy, get a free house. Any way you look at it, battery costs, which went down you know, by almost 90%, we expect another 80 plus percent over the next 10 years. This in itself is very important. The battery costs going down exponentially, this can help like um, just storing of energy. And this also benefits like electric cars. So if the battery cost goes down, technically the cost of the car, the input cost of the car goes down. And then if the input cost of the car goes down, the, the battery, if the input cost of the car goes down, they basically can make the battery last longer. All right, let's continue. Drop in costs, right? That convergence of solar, wind, and battery is already happening. Solar and wind are the cheapest sources of energy, period. And we expect that combination of solar, wind, and battery to be 70% cheaper by 2030, right? So the cheapest sources of energy are becoming 70% cheaper. What do you think is going to happen? This is gonna change everything. There is no reason to use anything else, right? This appears the other things that we found. There is a non-linear trade-off between generation and storage. So this is not just a one-to-one -one substitution of, you know, you take out a coal plant and you put in solar, wind, and battery, and, and so on, right? If you overbuild, quote unquote, solar, you need fewer batteries. And if you underbuild, then you, you need more batteries. So there is a non-linear, it's a U-curve. We call that the clean energy U-curve and superpower, meaning, because we have so much more capacity to generate the demand that we already have, we're going to generate vast amounts of energy in addition to meeting existing demand. And that's super abundant, zero marginal cost energy. How so? In California, we can generate nearly twice the electricity that we generate today for free. And this is superpower, 93% of days. And even in New England, 64% of days, they can generate uh, almost twice as much energy as they generate today, right? Anywhere in the world, we've looked. Um, we have found massive, some more than others, of course, depending on geography and demand, superpower. And superabundant clean energy changes everything, right? And it's not just disruptive to electric power. It's disruptive to all forms of energy. So if you think about Texas, for instance, the existing demand in blue and orange is superpower, meaning that's the um, superabundant excess clean energy generation that is essentially zero cost. If you invest in the least cost system, essentially Texas could generate, could meet all of its transportation needs using this superpower. If Texas chooses to build a slightly bigger system, so invest 20% more money, it could meet all its transportation, residential and commercial usage and a lot of the industrial energy usage. It's disruptive to everything. You could essentially space heat, industrial heat. It can all be met with solar, wind, and batteries. And superpower, like I said, is free, right? But it's not a one-to-one -one substitution. 
In Texas, for instance, solar capacity would be nine times higher than wind capacity, right? So the solar opportunity is a lot larger than the mainstream one-to-one -one substitution implies. Nine times more solar. And in fact, Texas would need just 49 hours of storage to combine with solar and wind to meet all its existing demand, right? Two full days of storage. Think about it. The outages that we had um, in Texas recently would not have happened if they had a solar, wind, and battery infrastructure. They would have had two full days of storage, no matter what, even if you know there's no sunshine and there's no wind. And this, of course, doesn't include distributed storage uh, in electric vehicles and so on. What about Alaska? Can you do that in Alaska, solar, wind, and batteries? Yep, you can. So I was recently there uh, with my Rethink X team. We studied uh, three regions in Alaska, Anchorage and the rail belt, uh, the largest one, Juneau, the capital, and Kotzebue, which is north of the Arctic Circle. In all of these regions, you can meet 100% of the demand with solar, wind, and batteries. Now, uh, Alaska has um, a lot of uh, hydro that is already installed. So um, essentially, if you keep the existing hydro, you don't have to tear it down. You don't need to build new hydro. You can meet 100% of the uh, electric power and energy demand in, in Alaska with just solar, wind, and batteries, even 30 miles north of the Arctic Circle, period. What about Germany? Northern country, economic power, can they do 100% solar, wind, and battery? Yes, they can. And Germany can meet all its electricity needs with solar and wind and batteries and about 110 hours of battery storage. That's all they need. So there's no need for seasonal storage, but they need uh, a lot of solar, right? In fact, they need more solar than wind to meet all those needs. And they can meet all their electricity needs. And if they invest in a system that is 20% more investment than the least cost system, essentially Germany could generate more than twice their existing electricity demand in superpower. So they can generate twice their existing demand for electricity um, and you know the 600 terawatt hours are essentially superpower, free, right? What can Germany do with a power uh, infrastructure that generates twice for a lot less money than um, basically today? And they can be self-sufficient. They don't need to import anything, right? Gas or whatever. Um, they don't need to be held hostage uh, for their energy needs. Right? And this changes economic development. So for Texas, 100% solar, wind, and battery with 20% upsizing, which would cost just about $42 billion, with that incremental superpower, right? So that system could meet all the demand, today's electricity demand, and that superpower could power every data center in the world every Bitcoin miner in the world, and they would still have 106 terawatt hours. So basically, if Texas were to invest 20% more on, um, in cleaner energy, the superpower energy, basically the solar, wind, and batteries, they would be able to have enough energy to cover their regular going about and then they would also be able to cover every data center in the world every bitcoin miner in the world all clean steel produced in the usa and they would still have energy left over to do other things yes or any other purposes all that is superpower that's free energy right that's how superpower changes everything it changes water desalination, it changes uh, waste, it changes manufacturing. It has geopolitical consequences, superpower. 
solar, wind, and battery superpower changes everything. All right, thank you. If you watch this through, you can look for Tony Seba online. You can look for videos of him on YouTube, and he also has a website, TonySeba.com. I'll be sharing more clean energy videos as we go along because I find a lot of this interesting. Even a point where solar panels are able to extract energy from solar just using the UV rays, it's able to pick up the UV rays even if there isn't any a lot of solar presence outside that you can realize as a human like you can't see that there is like sunlight out but the solar panel is still able to extract energy from the sun and you could store that in a battery or use that to power a house or something but thank you and see you in the next video